Well, thank you, and it is a great privilege to be here, and a great privilege to think about this topic together. I mean, we've just sung holy, holy, holy. We've been assisted in being brought into the presence of the Lord by hearing God's word read to us at length, and now we get to think for a few minutes together about this important topic of worship. Let me tell you how I want to use this time together. I want us to go first to where we get that phrase in the Bible, worship in spirit and truth. That's, of course, from John 4. We'll spend just a few minutes there. But then being that we're at a conference, I want to move right ahead and just do some topical teaching on worship, and I want to give you 13 propositions on worship that should give you plenty to talk about over lunch. All right? First, though, let's turn to see where we get this phrase that's the title of this talk. You know, in John's Gospel is where it's found, and in John's Gospel we have this wonderful pair of conversations in John 3 and John 4. John 3, the famous conversation of Jesus with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, this religious leader of Israel. And then in John 4, Jesus has this conversation with an immoral Samaritan woman. You couldn't get much more opposite on the social scale of ancient Palestine. And yet, one of the remarkable things that we see by this pair of conversations is that both these people fundamentally have the same need. Both must be saved by the coming Messiah. Well, let's turn particularly to John 4. It's in that second conversation. Jesus is drawn into talking with this woman at the well, or he draws her in. And he utters these famous words down in verses 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. A time is coming and has now come. And I think that's crucial to us understanding this well. A time is coming and has now come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, uh, there have been many ways these words have been understood. And frankly, when you go back and you read the commentaries, it seems like godly men have just taken whatever they can associate with the word spirit and whatever they can associate with the word truth, and they've written about it. And they've written a lot of great things. I think when people just read these in their small groups or their Sunday school classes, very often the conversations I hear go something like this. Well, to worship in spirit means you have to really get into it. You have to kind of feel it emotionally. And to worship in truth means that you need to be sincere in your worship. No false worship. Well, uh, taken certain ways, I think both those statements are true. I don't think that's quite what Jesus is getting at here. Uh, that way of reading this is more like the subjective age that we're living in, that focuses on us and how we experience something. I think what Jesus was teaching here was fundamentally that there's one quality, not two, one quality that's needed for worship to be acceptable. That is worship in spirit and in truth. I don't think in the teaching of Jesus, and especially in the teaching in John's Gospel, you would ever see spirit and truth separated. I think when Jesus talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth here, he means the spirit, not so much your spirit or my spirit, but I think he means the Holy Spirit, who in this gospel is referred to as the spirit of truth. In chapter 14 and 15 and 16, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the truth about Jesus Christ, is the center of Christian worship of true worship, of the kind of worship here that God is said to be seeking. So the call to worship in spirit and in truth is clearly an attack on false understandings of worship. Uh, like this woman here, you know, Jesus was getting uncomfortably close to where she lived. He was making observations, asking certain kinds of questions. And so she, like the canny woman I think she was, quickly changed the topic of conversation to theology and fairly removed theology. 
You know, where, where should we worship as if the physical location is the key matter? You know, the Samaritans focused on Mount Gerizim and Ebal, not on the temple in Jerusalem. But if you look at Jesus' response here, it's focused not on the place, but when he says in spirit and in truth, he's focusing on the person. Yes, how they must come themselves subjectively, but more to the point even, I think how they must come to God, and that is only in spirit and in truth. David Peterson, in his book Engaging with God, has put it well, I think. He says, in effect, the exalted Christ is now the place where God is to be acknowledged and honored. The Father cannot now be honored unless Jesus is given all the honor due to him as the Son. You see, friends, he's saying you can't worship God without honoring Jesus and without recognizing Christ as the truth. He is the focus of our worship. That's what we find in the New Testament book of Hebrews. The New Testament book of Hebrews takes a tour of Old Testament worship and shows how all of that worship pointed to Christ, was fulfilled in Christ. And in John's gospel, we even learned back in chapter 2 that Jesus is the true temple. He is the place where we meet with God. He is the one also that John has just set up at the end of chapter 3. He is the one whom God, to whom God gives the Spirit without limit. So you see these ideas of spirit and truth come together, and that's why I think Jesus said, has now come, or is coming and has now come to this woman because he is standing before her, the very Messiah, the one prophesied, the way of access to God, that only way through which ultimately we could truly come to God in worship was standing before her. It's evidently God's nature that determines the nature of worship. And his nature is nowhere more clearly seen in spirit and in truth than in his incarnation, in the Word made flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, as we read here. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We must come to him through Jesus, the Messiah. Now, if I were preaching at my local congregation in Washington, we would just spend a whole hour just looking at those verses and thinking about that. And you can do that perhaps back in your own congregation. But since we have the opportunity at a conference setting to think about this, I thought there would be some good things for us to think about and discuss together. So what I'd like to do is think particularly with the time that we have here about, I, I want to give you 13 overlapping propositions. There are a lot more propositions we could say that are true about worship. But 13, and I don't want to focus particularly uh, not on private worship, though I'll deal with that a little bit, not on family worship, which is a very important topic, but particularly on public corporate worship, because that's where I think a lot of our questions are today that we should try to look at more carefully. So I'm going to give 13 statements, and you know, I think that there are many evangelicals today who would either disagree with each one of these statements, or at least need to be convinced it wouldn't have been clearly taught this. So I'm not going to spend long on any one of them. What I'm doing basically is running down a long hallway, stopping to throw open a door, inviting you to go into the door, pointing some things out, and then running on to the next one. All right? So you get to take time over lunch, and as you look through your Bible, you think about your own church back home, trying to talk more and think more about these things. Number one, a statement that might seem unexceptionable at first, but that I think if you think about it, uh, maybe there would be some debate. Number one, God cares about how he's worshipped. God cares about how he's worshipped. There's a lot that we could say into this. For, for example, one of the things that's presumed today is that there is no sin but the sin of the heart. There is no sin but sins that are intentional. But friends, in the Old Testament, there are clear examples of unintentional sins that are given there are specific sacrifices that are even prescribed for sins which are unintentional. Scripture makes it clear in the Old and the New Testaments that God cares about the heart, yes, but He cares about more than the heart. He cares about what we actually do. He cares how He is approached. We see that even here in John 4. In fact, Jesus says here in John 4, 23, that God seeks those who will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
This is the only time in the Bible where God is said to seek anything. And this desire of God's is clear throughout the Bible. From his casting out of Adam and Eve in the garden to the assurance that no one impure will be in the heavenly city at the end. From the destruction that comes on Israel from worshiping the golden calf to the concerns in the New Testament about how Christians were to, were to and were not to behave when they came to the Lord's Supper and in the assembly generally. From the first commandment about having no other gods to the whole book of Malachi to Romans 12 that we just heard part of, it is, it is clear that God cares how he is approached. And if you have any doubts about that, just ask Nadab and Abihu. Now, I know that not all people who call themselves Christians would agree with this point. So-called liberal Christians don't think that the Bible is a reliable guide to knowing what God wants. So they can make decisions about everything from sexuality to salvation, from gender issues to worship matters, without reference to an authoritative scripture because they don't think there is one. More conservative Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic theologies understand the church is the reliable guide of first call for the Christian when questions about worship come up. They think that the Bible's truths are just a subset of what church tradition has preserved, and that therefore, though something may appear one way in the Bible, the church is the final arbiter and determiner. It therefore has the right to determine how Christians must worship God. Traditional evangelical Protestants have taken another position. All agree that the Bible alone is authoritative, unlike the theological liberals, and sufficient, unlike our Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic theologies that exist. However, even inside that, evangelical Protestants have found a spectrum on how they would decide what is okay in worship. And it runs from the position that everything is okay in worship that isn't forbidden in Scripture over to the position that only those things positively taught, either directly or indirectly in Scripture, are to be allowed. So practically, basically, some Protestants have said that the burden of proof is on the person who wants to deny a certain practice. And others, more conservatively, have said it's on the people who want to advocate a certain practice. Given God's carefulness in Scripture, the latter, more careful attitude seems wiser to me. So, for example, God has revealed himself to us in the Ten Commandments. We know that we are to make no form of him, all evangelical Protestants would, at least traditionally, agree on that until some new thoughts have emerged. But more positively, how are we to worship Him? How are we to worship Him? Well, that question is best answered, I think, not by beginning with the redeemed heart, because the redeemed heart is still fallible in our creative devotion to God. But that question is best answered by the inspired Word of God, which is infallible. Well, all of that from this first proposition, God cares about how He is worshipped. All right, a second proposition. Worship is fundamentally about God. Worship is fundamentally about God. This is what it means to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It, it's not so much a place as a person that you're focused on. It must be focused on Him, and supremely, as He has revealed Himself to us in Jesus Christ. And notice that God is the one who must reveal Himself, or there is no certain knowledge of Him. You know, there is something in all of us that wants to worship. We're said to be innate worshipers. It's Dostoevsky in his novel, The Brothers Karamazov, who said, so long as man remains free, he strives for nothing so incessantly and so painfully as to find something to worship. But though this urge to worship is deep-seated in us, it's even innate, I think, it's not about us fundamentally. This can be hard to grasp. I think Don Carson's done a great job of it in his introduction to his book, Worship by the Book. 
Uh, in this book, he says at one point, you cannot find excellent corporate worship until you stop trying to find excellent corporate worship and pursue God himself. Despite the protestations, one sometimes wonders if we're beginning to worship worship rather than worship God. As a brother put it to me, it's a bit like those who begin by admiring the sunset and soon begin to admire themselves admiring the sunset. Friends, worship is about God. It's not about us. Now, how we worship does reflect on God. I just argued for that. So we must care about that for God's name's sake, though. We see this connection between God's nature and our worship in many places in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 4, the fact that God doesn't have a physical form leads to there being no physical images of Him allowed. Here in John 4, we see worshiping Him in spirit and in truth is demanded by His own nature. God is spirit. He's not just a locality or an idol in a location. So God's nature determines how we should worship Him. Christian worship must reflect and express God's nature and His character, His transcendence and His eminence. And since Christ is the fullest revelation of God, our worship must focus on the cross. Such Christian worship proclaims what God is truly like, and such worship shapes us in being more like the one whom we worship. Because worship is about God. All right, number three. Worship involves our whole lives. Worship involves our whole lives. By this, I don't mean you have a lot of time in choir practice around Christmas. No, it, it mean, I, I mean by this that worship certainly involves more than music. The innate tendency to worship, I just mentioned, points us to the fact that we were created to worship God and to worship Him with our whole lives. This is what that great first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism reminds us of. You know, what is the chief end of man? It is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that's done by living our whole lives in response to the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, friend, when you come to this topic of worship, you want to ask yourself, do you have such a wide and comprehensive view of worship? Let's say you're moving to a new area. You're visiting different churches. Do you ever get the idea of the way some churches talk about worship that if we blew a fuse, people would think the Holy Spirit is gone? Surely that can't be right. Surely we cannot be so dependent upon technologies that the Christians in the New Testament didn't have in order to, to be obedient to God's command to worship Him. It's very interesting, actually, if you, if you look at the, the way the New Testament speaks about worship, it's very clear that music does not define our worship, as wonderful as music is. There are no New Testament words, get ready for this, there are no New Testament words, Greek words, that are regularly translated worship in our English translations of the New Testament, that ever are associated exclusively, even with the public Christian gathering, let alone with music in the public Christian gathering, none. Not the proskenai words, not the sebamai words, not the latria words, not the letergai words, none of them, not once in the New Testament, is worship associated fundamentally with the Christian assembly, the Christian gathering. We are commanded to worship, that's clear from Hebrews 10, we're commanded to worship together, to assemble, but that's part of the lifelong worship that we read about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Renewing your mind, being a living sacrifice. My friends, according to the New Testament, this is the heart of worship. All of life for the Christian is a worship of the God of the Bible or of something else. Now, you see, I'm ratcheting up on, on each one of these 13. I'm starting slow and easy so you'll all be agreeing. But by this, even this third proposition, I just want to 
to point out the way we use that word worship sometimes probably doesn't help some of our brothers and sisters standing in the congregation struggling with sin, let alone non-Christian friends. Do you understand that in some of our assemblies it's quite possible that there is a, a, a man standing there and because of the moving music he's singing Amazing Grace with tears streaming down his face. And yet, if he is committing adultery, he isn't worshiping God. If he is unrepentantly continuing on in sin, and if we have spoken about worship in such a way that makes him feel somehow a cathartic emotional experience when he's at church is worship, and he's ticked that worship box, then we are being unfaithful to the New Testament. We are not being faithful to what God has revealed about how we are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Do you understand the significance of this? How this affects us in our churches, in the way we speak of worshiping God? Worship is our whole lives if we're Christians. Number four, worship is fundamentally hearing and responding to God's Word. Worship is fundamentally hearing and responding to God's Word. So let me be clear. I don't think we just had a time of worship and now we're not worshiping. Fundamentally what worship is, is hearing God's Word and responding to it. That's because according to the Bible, in the Old and the New Testaments, worship is not fundamentally an inarticulate aesthetic experience. Rather, it is hearing and understanding and considering and responding. Worship is not one part of our service together. It's the whole of it, and it's not simply the musical portion. In fact, it is really the preaching of the Word that's central to this worship. I remember one time in London at All Souls Church, I was giving a, an all-day seminar on Puritanism. And at this one point, I was doing a part in the lecture on the Puritan's understanding of worship. And uh, we, it wasn't that large a group, and, and we were spending all Saturday together, and I was giving them some little historical details, and I was making this very point. And I said, uh, look, uh, have any of, you, do any of you ever spend time looking around old churches? And we were in England, there were very old churches all over the place, and a lot of people said yes. And I said, have any of you ever noticed that metal thing coming out of the side of the pulpit up like this, just with a, around with a circle? maybe up in the churches up in East Anglia. And a few people nodded their heads. I said, do you have any idea what those are? Nobody had any real idea. I said, those are gifts of the congregation to the minister, usually given sometime in the late 1500s, early 1600s, and it was to hold an hourglass holder, an hourglass. Because they would give the minister one or two turns of the hourglass for his sermon. Now, when I said that, one woman audibly gasped. And she exclaimed, what time did that leave for worship? And I just kind of held myself and thought, well, you know, I hear the whole Protestant Reformation going down the tubes right there. But she's not thinking about that. Well, we went on and kept talking after that. It became clear as we talked together that Scripture is at the center of our worship, and hearing it. If we want to become more Christ-like, if that's the, one of the ends of our worship, that means we have to be engaged. There can't be an insincere ritual. Sincerity is not sufficient for biblical worship, but it is necessary for it. As Christians, we want to engage our whole being with God's revelation of Himself and what He's revealed of Himself in the Bible. This is why we never as Christians want to pit the personal relationship with God against propositional truth about God. We have a personal relationship by virtue of God revealing truth about Himself and about us and about Christ. Apart from truth, there is no relationship. A life of obedience flows from a heart of thanksgiving. Worship is fundamentally hearing and responding to God's Word. Therefore, a fifth statement, worship involves our will and our emotions. 
Worship will also involve our will and our emotions. Though both decisions and emotional responses to God are appropriate and they're legitimate parts of Christian worship, we need to realize that that understanding is first and then decisions based on that understanding and that emotions follow. It was Donald Gray Barnhouse, who we saw just a moment ago in the Alliance video, who said that love that stoops down is grace. Love that rises up to God is worship. Worship involves our will and our emotions. Worship will also involve our will and our emotions. Though both decisions and emotional responses to God are appropriate and they're legitimate parts of Christian worship, we need to realize that that understanding is first and then decisions based on that understanding and that emotions follow. It was Donald Gray Barnhouse, who we saw just a moment ago in the Alliance video, who said that love that stoops down is grace. Love that rises up to God is worship. You see what he means? There is in love this this core, this core of the will that includes the mind's understanding and the heart's trusting. But this will, this decision, naturally has a healthy emotional consequence that follows. So it is with the worship of God. It's our obedience and service to Him. That's how you can translate worship, service. It's our obedience and honoring him by our lives as we don't carry his name in vain, but as we take up his name honorably in living our lives that brings glory in such a way that brings glory to his name. But yet this obedience, this service service is inextricable from affection for him. And it grows trust of and love for him even as we obey him. That's why... Christian worship should be accompanied by joy, by a satisfaction, a relishing of God in His certain promises. So Christian worship will also involve our will and our emotions. Number six, public worship should be distinguished from private worship. Public worship should be distinguished from private worship. I say this because sometimes I fear members of churches will get confused Because they'll know certain things that God says are good and that He wants, and yet there's not been careful teaching about, well, does this apply to the public assembly, or does this apply to simply everyday life? I think there's a legitimate distinction to be made between what is appropriate in public Christian service and in private Christian service. So, for instance, consider some of the ways that you in your own Christian life can obey God. Well, all of your obedience is worship to God. Can you think of any of those ways that it's appropriate for you to obey God by yourself or in smaller settings where it's not appropriate for you to do that in public worship? Scripture tells us everything we're to do, we're to do to the glory of God, but that doesn't mean we do it in church, so to speak. Anything we do, we're to do to the glory of God. So, friend, you, you, can, you can eat to the glory of God, you can sleep to the glory of God, you can think of other things you can do to the glory of God that are appropriate to you following God and the callings He's given you in private or in your families that you're not called to do in the public assembly. There are particular things that we are called to do that are appropriate to the public worship of God. Well, what are these scriptural elements of the corporate worship of God? Are there ordained means through which we approach God in our gatherings? Yes, there are. The Bible tells us about these. There are certain elements that are to be present in our services. So though you can go to this church or that church and they may look different, if you see these basic elements, that's the most fundamental question. That's where we begin in wanting to understand and evaluate our services together, our worship. Those elements would be prayer, singing, reading the Word, preaching the Word, administering baptism and the Lord's Supper. You can find references to all of these in Scripture. As it's been summarized before, in our assemblies, we are called to read the Bible, preach the Bible, pray the Bible, sing the Bible, and see the Bible in the sense of the gospel proclaimed in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Friends, a lot of confusion could be prevented if we simply remember that public worship should be distinguished from private worship.
Number seven, public worship is the business of the church assembled. Public worship is the business of the church assembled. So what we do, not quite so much when or where we do it, as in Jesus' conversation here, what we do is the point. Uh, the church must assemble. That's essential. We are warned not to forsake the regular assembling of ourselves together. In fact, by implication, Christians have always understood that Hebrews 10, 25 shows us that regular non-attendance at public worship is potentially, depending on the circumstances that cause that non-attendance, regular non-attendance is a grave and disciplinable offense. Church discipline even itself is an act of worship, if that's part of our obedience to God. Friends, in order to do this, we must first, though, congregate. If we don't congregate, there's no congregation. So to have public worship, we must first congregate. Now, the time and the place for congregating are not prescribed in the New Testament in the same way as they were for Old Testament Israel. Old Testament Israel had a, a, a very ornate ritual that was all built up to point to the coming Messiah, and you can read the book of Hebrews about this. In the New Testament, neither a uniform time like ours for prayer nor place are essential to corporate worship, nor are they sufficient. That means you can have been to church and yet not truly worshipped. Such externals of our assemblies are not the point of worship, though they're often a lot easier to fight about. Neither the woman in John 4, nor so many of us seem to understand very well what's going on with what's essential in worship. What Jesus is saying here in part is that these externals you are pointing to aren't the point. Uh, the temple, so for example, was fulfilled in Christ, as was the Sabbath, we read in Hebrews. Pews, pulpits, windows are not needed for Christian worship. There is more in the New Testament to speak to the when of our public worship than the where. So Christians have always met on the first day of the week ever since the resurrection. Because that was the great time when the first fruits of the great final resurrection began, and in celebration of that, Christians immediately started meeting on the Lord's Day on the first day of the week. If you talk to, or if you read apologetics about the resurrection, in fact, that's one of the most telling arguments that's used. Because sociologists all know, and anthropologists know, the most conservative traits of any people are their religious practices. They can go back centuries or even millennia, long since people have even forgot why they did them in the first place. But here, immediately, these Jews all began meeting on the first day of the week. Something tremendous must have happened. And they do that, it looks like, throughout the New Testament. The first day we know is called the Lord's Day in the New Testament. And how appropriate that like the, with the first fruits of our money, we give the first of it to God, so with the first fruits of our time in the week, we give it to God. The church calendar in the New Testament seems not to be annual, it seems to be weekly. And it begins always with the public worship of God as we assemble, because that is the church's business. The public worship of God is the business of the assembled church. Much more we could say on that, but move on. Number eight, public worship should edify the congregation. Public worship should edify the congregation. If you want to look more at this, look at 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, where Paul is sorting through, I think, a very difficult situation or several situations in the church at Corinth. And the ruler he keeps putting all the situations up to is will this edify the congregation? Will the congregation be built up? Will they be strengthened by this? It was the standard by which it was to discer be discerned what was to be done in the assembly. You see, love aims not only at making much of God, which I assume we'll get no disagreement on in this conference, thus I'm not spending more time on that. I've already said worship is fundamentally about God. But love also entails being careful to make much of God by building up others who are his people. So in Hebrews 10, 25, we read that the purpose of our regular assembling is to encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Public worship should edify the congregation. Take that principle around the block, try it out, See if that works, all right? Number nine, public worship is not based on a certain musical style. Public worship is not based fundamentally on a certain 
musical style. In fact, to base our understanding of an approach to corporate worship all on a certain style of music is at least immature and at worst destructive of the church and dishonoring to God. Carson again writes, what ought to make worship delightful to us is not in the first instance its novelty or its aesthetic beauty, but its object. God himself is delightfully wonderful, and we learn to delight in him. We want to help rather than hinder our appreciating and celebrating God's glory. We want to do that with music. We want to exalt the cross of Christ. We want to kindle our hope for heaven and other glorious truths. The God we sing about should excite us more than the music we use distracts us. Music is a tool that we use, and it's a wonderful tool. But that should be the maturity and worship we strive for, to be more sensitive to the God we sing of than we are to the music that we use to do it. So while we want music that reflects God's glory rather than obscures it, and we want to work for that in our churches, to the saved heart, the richness of the gospel will always exceed even the most impoverished music because we know what our hope is based on and it's based in the work of Christ where God has loved us amazingly. Therefore, in our services together, we want to try to think what we can do to bring glory to God and not simply to think of things that we ourselves prefer. In fact, some of the musical styles that are preferred today, I think, are not helpful. Some of the worship styles. So, for example, I think the darkness that there are in many, the, the physical darkness in many church meetings with eyes closed, deafeningly loud music, tends to individualize the experience and undermine the proposition I gave right before this one, that the corporate worship should work to edify the whole congregation. We're thinking together as a whole about how we as a community can bring glory to God. One way you can help to unify and build your church together is by understanding and teaching others that public worship is not based fundamentally on a certain musical style. Number 10, passivity is always inappropriate in worship. Passivity is always inappropriate in worship. So worship is not something that you merely watch. Worship is something that you do. Boring sermons? No problem at all compared to disinterested listeners. You know, if the sermon is boring, that is my fault. If you're not getting anything out of it, that is your fault. You understand the responsibility there? We have the responsibility when we come together to be active. So we want to be reverent. Now that reverence is not the same thing as dead formalism. Spontaneity, though, is not the same thing as sincerity. You understand that prayers that you read can be very heartfelt. And prayers that are extemporaneous can be as cold and rote and formulaic and unmeant as anything you could imagine. Believe me, I'm a Southern Baptist, I know. You know, you can transport me to any number of Wednesday night prayer meetings, and I know exactly what the deacon is going to say about Mrs. Johnson in the hospital. And I know how it's going to be prayed for. And I'm not saying we never do that, but I'm saying we should be very careful not to assume that simply because somebody reads a prayer, that must not be good. And if you do it spontaneously, then it must be sincere and appropriate. That's not true, friends. You can pray extemporaneously well and poorly. And you can use a a written prayer well or poorly. We don't want to be passive. You know, when we look in the Bible and we see people encountering God, they seem to have these amazing reactions. Job is undone. Moses prostrates himself. Isaiah and Ezekiel, Thomas all fall down, as do the very angels in heaven, forever before the Lamb. But look at our services today. We have acted as if casualness is the height of intimacy with God. And that is not what the Bible presents at all when you encounter the true God, the real God. Do our services show that kind of active reverence, that kind of heightened anticipation that comes from meeting together as God's people? Brothers and sisters, we want to cultivate appropriate congregational participation. We want to do that even in the very way we have Scripture read. Can we never have responsive readings of Scripture? We see that going on in the Old Testament. Friends, have you ever thought of saying amen after a prayer in public? Not just because you really like it, amen. 
But I mean just condition yourself that when you are in the presence of another Christian and they pray, if you agree with that prayer, you will say amen or amen. I don't care how you pronounce it so much. But that you will say that. I think that helps to remind us that this is a corporate thing. That we are doing this corporately. So I discipline myself. Even when I'm in groups who don't understand it at all. Somebody prays, I agree with it, I say amen. I am not there passively. I am there actively participating. Music, I think, that highlights the congregation rather than the performers. Perhaps even congregational parts rather than one melody line. All is good stuff for you to think about over lunch. Passivity is always inappropriate in worship. Number 11, and verbal response. Very good. <laughs> Keep it coming. It can be useful. Thank you. Number 11, corporate worship is worth preparing for. Corporate worship is worth preparing for. You know, in Exodus 19, the Lord gives the people three days advance notice of his coming to meet with, with Moses and give the law on the mountain. What are the ways that we in our own churches are preparing for public worship throughout the week? I'll tell you one practical way we do it. We print the sermons that are coming up, not the text of the sermon, but just literally the text of Scripture that will be preached on. So this morning when I got in the car with Ryan from our church, I could say to Ryan, hey, Ryan, did you read Psalm 9 this morning? He said, yeah, wasn't it great? I said, oh, yeah, I read it too in my quiet time this morning. Because John Fulmer, one of our dear brothers at the church, is preaching Sunday morning on Psalm 9. So every day of that week coming up to the Lord's Day, I will read the text that's being preached on, whether it's being preached on by me or somebody else. And the whole church then, Lord willing, assembles with appetites prepared and whetted for being fed and meditating on God through that portion of Scripture. Friends, on Saturday night, what do you do with your time? If you had an important day at work, important test at school, you'd be doing something about it the night before. Do you give any time the night before, even, to preparing for corporate worship. Friends, have you ever thought of turning up at church early? <laughs> Seeing what you can do to help? Showing that you understand the importance of this, and, and it's a time for the whole community to come together, and you want us to be there to serve any way you can. We'll talk about service more, Lord willing, this afternoon. But have you thought about that? When I was in South Africa a few years ago preaching there, I was struck and convicted by the way so many of the congregation would turn up 45 minutes or an hour early just to pray. They just got together and they would just pray that the Lord would bless the time. Oh, friends, have you thought that corporate worship is that valuable, that it's worth preparing for? Number 12, true Christian worship services, and you might be surprised by this one, but I think it's true, Pick it up with the question and answer session tonight. True Christian worship services will attract non-Christians. Hmm. You have to be very careful with this. I'm not suggesting seeker-sensitive services. I am suggesting seeker-sensitive lives where people come together as authentic human beings and followers of Christ. We do know it'll be attractive to those unbelievers that God is drawing. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 2? For we are to be the aroma we are. To God, rather, the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are, the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. Those being saved. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I am not for one moment saying you should calibrate your gathering time the time that all Christians come together on Sunday morning to praise God, hear His Word read and preached, and to sing His praises and pray. I'm not saying you should calibrate that to the unbeliever. Rather, I'm saying if you will work to calibrate that to Scripture, that will be one of the best pictures of the gospel you can give your unbelieving friends. This doesn't mean that we want everything to be happy, clappy all the time. I'm not saying that at all. Frankly, there needs to be a Psalms like realism in our readings and sermons, even in our songs, including the misery and brokenness that we know from our sin and, and the passing unsatisfying nature of this world. We do, from time to time, get questions at our church, sometimes even from people joining about, why some of the hymns we sing are such downers? And I have a, a great article Carl Truman did as an editorial in Themelios a few years ago, Why Do Miserable Christians Sing? I just hand it to them. Say, read this. 
Carl Truman, professor at Westminster, has put the case better than I could. He, in this editorial, he notes that psalms have dropped out of evangelical public services, and he speculates. I'm not certain about why this should be, but I have an instinctive feel that it has more than a little to do with the fact that a high proportion of psalms are taken up with lamentation, with feeling sad, unhappy, tormented, and broken. In modern Western culture, these are simply not emotions which have much credibility. Sure, people still feel these things, but to admit that they are a normal part of one's everyday life is tantamount to admitting that one has failed in today's health, wealth, and happiness society. But in the Psalms, God has given the church a language which allows it to express even the deepest agonies of the human soul in the context of worship. By excluding cries of loneliness and dispossession and desolation from its worship, the church has effectively silenced and excluded the voices of those who are themselves lonely and dispossessed and desolate, both inside and outside the church. It has implicitly endorsed the banal aspirations of consumerism and generated an insipid, trivial, and unrealistically triumphalist Christianity. In the last year, I've asked three very different evangelical audiences what miserable Christians can sing in church. On each occasion, my question has elicited uproarious laughter, as if the idea of a broken-hearted, lonely, or despairing Christian was so absurd as to be comical. And yet I pose the question in all seriousness. Friends, honesty in our services, honesty about our struggles, about our joys, honesties of both in the light of eternity are exactly the kind of witness we should be giving to the people, the people who don't know Christ, whose only hopes are fading and tawdry and small. Friend, this is an opportunity for us. Such honesty won't only minister to our own people, it will, as I say, actually, I think, strike our friends who aren't Christians as authentic and true because it is true Christian worship. And that, I think, will be attractive. Final thing. If you're truly a Christian, this is number 13, if you're truly a Christian, corporate worship is your future. If you're truly a Christian, corporate worship is your future. Worship on earth is preparation for worship in heaven. Throughout Scripture, God is represented as reigning forever and being forever praised. And this worship is not going to be limited to any earthly temple. The prophets Isaiah and Habakkuk tell of a day when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as, as the waters cover the sea. And if you look at the end of Revelation, you see the glorious fellowship that we will eternally have with God. In Revelation 21, 16, we see that this is the city of God, the city that's being pictured here. And it is so because it's indicated by the city's unusual shape. If you look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 16, or just note it down right now, we read, the city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. Now, if the fact that this was the city of God had for any reason escaped the notice of John's readers, John's recounting the shape of the city would drive the point home. Can you think of why this city is a cube? What else in the Bible has the shape of a cube? The Holy of Holies. The place of God's special presence with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the temple. You can read more about that in 1 Kings 6. So this brilliant cube that John describes here would have certainly brought to their minds the Holy of Holies. The only difference is now in this vision of our future, if we're Christians, the only difference is now is that what in the past only the high priest could do alone, and he could only do it once a year, and that in just a model, now all of God's people will be able to do forever and for real as we come to live inside the Holy of Holies with God himself. Friends, this is our great hope. This is that to which we run in the Bible, the story of man begins in a garden and it ends in a city, the city of God. And it is a city full of the glorious presence of God. And it's full of you and me if we worship him in spirit and in truth. If you're a Christian, corporate worship is your future. Let's pray together. Lord, how we respond to your truth is something that could fill our minds, and Lord, must fill our minds the rest of our lives. We pray you would use this time together to help us to better understand you and what you call us to be and do for your glory's sake.
and for the building up of your churches, we ask it in Jesus' name.